All right, awesome. So yeah, um, you want to just lead us into it, I guess? Yeah. Hey, everybody. It's uh, Danky Kang here with friends FVK1917 and Tactical Spork, and we are here to talk a little bit about uh, linen. Uh, now, it was linen's 150th birthday yesterday, a pretty big occasion, and linen is in the news right now. There's lots of articles being written about him, lots of tweets being made about him, and there's a lot of criticism out there of Lenin and Leninism and the Soviet-style system and China and, and whatnot, and we feel the need to address some of these comments here on air. Yeah, awesome. So, um, Danky released a video, I believe, early today or yesterday, yeah. um, talking about some of the some things about Lenin. But um, this comment stood out in particular to me, at least, and I think I think to him as well, um, because this is actually a very interesting. Uh, if you want to pull it up, just so maybe the viewers can look at it, um, DMT here has actually a really interesting uh, comment that I think maybe is shared by a lot of people who are sympathetic to socialism and the left, but um, may be very skeptical, very critical about um, the idea of a vanguard party, the idea of Marxism-Leninism. Um, and so we, actually this is a very interesting comment. And even though uh, a lot of it is actually incorrect and we're going to address all of that kind of thing, it's incorrect in a very interesting way and in a way that I think by going into it, maybe we can learn um, some things about uh, these countries that he's addressing and also just uh, learn about what the Vanguard Party is and what it isn't. So yeah, um, do you have any any comments before we kind of go into it um, from either of you? Nah, I think I'm good to go. All right, awesome. Yeah, so yeah, this is um, super interesting. Starting off, basically he starts talking about if the Vanguard Party uh, talking about in the Soviet Union was in the, hand, uh, the hands of the proletariats in the Soviet, then how could Khrushchev take power and dismantle the USSR? Did the proletariats in the USSR vote for that? If not, how is it then a vanguard party of the proletariats? So um, this is something that I was thinking about a lot. And first off, I think we just need to, we need to clarify a few things about um, socialist countries as they exist. Um, we, I'd like to, have the viewers maybe imagine that they know absolutely nothing about the United States, right? They've never been there. They've never heard anything about it. But the only things that they've really come into contact with to learn about the United States are like um, conservative political cartoons or like Fox News, right? That's your only exposure to what the United States is, what the people are like, and what the politics are like in there right like your entire knowledge of that is shaped by these right-wing media outlets right obviously you're going to be given an extremely distorted impression of the united states right if, i'm assuming most of the viewers of this channel probably live in the u.s if they watch fox news or they look at these like ridiculous like ben garrison style political cartoons uh they would basically have a terrible they, they they would have a pretty easy time debunking them because it doesn't match with their experience and with the realities of what the united states is usually like and u.s politics are like but with countries like this where you can't really visit them very easily and the information that you have access to is extremely controlled right like if you go into school all you're going to hear is one particular perspective on these countries right and in the general kind of way that we talk about them like common sense normal people talking about these things they present a view of these things that is pretty much completely uh disconnected from you know the on the ground experience of what it was actually like in these countries and most people never actually take the time to actually learn about these things they just kind of take a lot of things for granted so I think that's something that we just need to, need to take into consideration, first of all, that we have this, from our very beginning, from our childhood, we are raised with a very one-sided, very distorted opinion of these countries. And so, first of all, let's just take that into consideration. Second of all, 
with these countries, we cannot evaluate them in a vacuum. Like these countries exist in the material world and not in the realm of abstraction, right? Yeah. Also, <laughs> these countries are not allowed to develop freely. Like we've never seen a socialist country develop without any external pressures acting on it, without any uh, powers that we're trying to or sabotage it, um, right? So they're by definition pretty much always growing up under extremely difficult circumstances in the first place and that has a distorting effect on these societies so let's look at the first thing that he talks about here did the proletarians in the ussr vote for that uh and how if how is it a vanguard of the proletariat so i think we should go into how soviet democracy actually works and you might think oh soviet democracy i thought that they were just a dictatorship i thought they were just ruled by a small elite group of bureaucrats ruling with an iron fist so i actually made a little infographic that i posted in here about soviet democracy it might be a little small for you to bring up you could hit open original or something to get a bigger picture of it but the first thing is people just generally have no idea how socialist countries actually operate um if, if the general way that people see these countries is extremely oversimplified and almost to a cartoonish degree right people actually have if you ask people oh what kind of government did the soviet union have they'll say oh it was a dictatorship okay how did the dictatorship work how did all of this stuff work they can't answer it they have no absolutely no idea what the actual mechanisms yeah. of these countries politics were at all and they can't explain any of them right in their minds these countries were run by a single person with a single idea everyone fell in line with them or they would get executed but actually if you look at soviet democracy if you can look this up you can look it up on wikipedia soviet democracy uh it was actually very interesting and it had a really interesting mixture of workplace democracy of bottom-up democracy council style democracy uh you would organize yourselves into local councils soviets that is why it's called the soviet union People would uh, nominate other members to be uh, delegates. They would vote on those with direct democracy. That was secret ballot. Um, and then your delegate would get elected upwards. Um, they would go up to a regional council, kind of like a town hall, city hall type thing. Um, and then those candidates in the United States, if you elect a candidate, that candidate can basically do whatever they want. Right, they can promise yeah. you that they're going to fix this road that they're going to build this bridge or whatever. Once they're in office, oh, never mind. We can't do it. Sorry. That's not the case in the Soviet Union, okay? You would elect your delegate and your representative, and they would be mandated whenever there was an election in, you know, these uh, meetings, these representative meetings, mm -hmm. they were mandated to vote for the policies that they promised to vote for, all right? Already, that's far more democratic of an ideal. We have have in the united states also doubling with that is the fact that there was no money no corporate money no super PACs, no special interest groups that influenced these people all right already making it far more in line with what people actually wanted right and then these delegates would get sent to other regional councils and they would have basically a an upward style from the bottom election of people who would manage at a regional level and eventually manage at a national level and all of this was basically done through direct democracy, through secret ballot, and through a uh, mandate style representational system. All right, this is what we call a dictatorship of the proletariat. This is what worker council democracy is. People say, oh, the Bolsheviks just wanted power. You know, they, they wanted to rule everybody from right, the top down. Yeah. This is about as bottom up as you can possibly get. And consider that this system was operating under immense amount of pressure from outside forces who wanted to destroy every aspect of this okay and, and, and you know, i'm not saying that it was perfect at all sorry yeah go uh, and you know the the ironic thing is when you talk to anarchists they describe in their ideal society a government structure that pretty much resembles something like this i think yes. where they draw opposition is that uh you have to be a member of the communist party 
and they don't like that whole notion like oh you can't uh you can't like be a rogue um candidate or, and and try to like worm your way into power but i don't know maybe you could comment a little bit about that right yeah absolutely so people equate one party system as in there's only one opinion that you can have there's only one way to get into politics you have to be basically a subservient uh basically drone that obeys the great leader or whatever yeah right but we have to realize so you have us i'm sorry one sec <laughs> so yeah basically <laughs> you have a revolutionary situation right and you have socialist countries you have capitalist countries right a capitalist country even though maybe it might have two major parties like the united states or something like that you cannot run a successful campaign you cannot really meaningfully get into electoral politics if you are not a capitalist to some degree yeah right but that does not mean that all capitalists are all on the same page all capitalist parties are on the same page obviously there's a difference a huge amount of difference between someone like bernie sanders and someone like uh you know donald trump dick cheney george bush all of those are capitalist candidates right but there's a huge amount of variation and debate within all of those things right so if we look at a country like the soviet union i mean yes it was one party in the same sense that the united states is a one-party state right all the candidates you know were maybe socialist but that doesn't mean that they all had the exact same opinions on everything right yeah the soviet union was a workers state that means that all of the candidates were socialists and they had to obey rules electoral rules that protected the interests of workers against the interests of the capitalists if you are an anarchist or you're a trotskyist or any other sort of revolutionary leader right you're you want your whatever system that you want to have even if it's a, a an anarchist kind of council confederation or something like that you do not want capitalist influence the in, the inordinate non-representative influence of huge amounts of money and imperial powers you don't want to have an imperialist party in your government right yeah just Why like the united yeah. states does not allow the united states does not allow serious competition from any left-wing party right the united states is a one-party state exactly. but it's a one-party state controlled by the capitalist class all states in the entire world are one-party states in that they uphold a certain relations of production right like you can't you can't have a both a capitalist and communist state at the same time the two things are right. not mutually exclusive uh, the two things are mutually exclusive right only one class can actually control the means of production at one time yeah and i i think that this kind of um ties into the question that dmt actually asked because um in regards to how did khrushchev come to power like you just pointed out even in these you know one party states um there are different tendencies you know in these classes so they're going to be different representations and absolutely. khrushchev was absolutely um you know a different trend in the working yes. class movement um so as far as like how did khrushchev come to power though um honestly i would refer unless one of you guys know more about it i would refer people to um finnish bolsheviks video the khrushchev coup yes um it is important to note that khrushchev um during that time, um, people were noting, like the day that Stalin died, it almost looked like there was a military takeover in Moscow that day. There was yes. like, um, Khrushchev had it, so there was actually like people manning the street and like, you know, so he could like, <laughs> you know, um, he came to power later on, but it was like, it was that section of the party essentially saying, we're going to consolidate our power now that the Stalin, yes. we're going to take advantage of this moment. So that's a big reason why um, Khrushchev came into power. Um, now, personally, I think it's fair to maybe critique the Soviet Union a little bit here. Um, you know, there's a fine line. We don't want to just like um, have a line of succession or anything like that and say we totally choose who's going to come to power after this guy. We want to make it democratic to a degree. But it's like, you know, it, it, it is shame. It is a shame that like Khrushchev was able to come in and there wasn't any like guard against something like that. So I think yes. that is something that we can learn from in the future. So, yes, this is absolutely, that's a really interesting point. Um, 
So we need to make a distinction between what happens in a country through the appropriate legal channels and the democratic channels of the country and times where people just completely disregard those rules and use alternative methods of subverting that system, right? And I think something like the Khrushchev situation is definitely one of those times that we can definitely learn from because what the deal with that was basically uh the the technical legal uh people who were meant to take over as general secretary um through the democratic channels they were actually appointed by the politburo which is like kind of like the big congress supreme soviet of the soviet union were malenkov and i believe beria who were kind of holding two separate positions and um just for the record beria was not a good dude uh, in my opinion but in the opinion of most people he was actually more towards the liberal end of the spectrum and he was uh had a whole bunch of just terrible personality uh problems uh, he was a pretty sadistic person in general and he uh actually did some pretty terrible things oh really um, like what he uh actually would abduct women on the street um and essentially take them to his house and uh, sexually abuse them and sometimes uh, kill them. He was the head of the NKVD. Yeah, Jesus. Um, and yeah, so he, he actually was able to amass a, a good amount of power for himself. Um, but this was not necessarily something that was particularly known at the time. Um, so that is obviously something that we need to keep in mind. We need to be able to hold our security councils, our security members to account obviously um but regardless of that he was actually able to through this democratic process uh actually kind of become sort of the next i think i think he was appointed as general secretary um but yeah so khrushchev i don't see him as an evildoer at all because a lot of people did see beria and his moves to actually he was actually very much in favor of uh, liberalizing the country in the in the sense of privatizing different things and also um, being more conciliatory towards the West than even Khrushchev was. Um, but there was a huge amount of instability that resulted as a, a, a result of Stalin basically dying unexpectedly. And um, yeah, I mean, Khrushchev's wing of the party was not necessarily the worst, but they did definitely take advantage of this confusion and they did try to basically uh, seize power illegally and so like yes so like, we can definitely learn from this for sure um but yeah like it's it it happened outside of the legal means is what i'm trying to say against the democratic yeah. process yeah it's not like uh, it, it it's unfortunate because it still happened under the guide of the dictatorship of the proletariat but it was, you know, an infringement on their normal democracy, how they would go about things. So, yeah, that's important to point out. Um, uh, I'm looking at the second question here. I see where he asks, if the Vanguard Party was in the hands of the proletariats in China, how could Deng take a, over the power and make China to what it is today, a capitalist state? Um, so there, okay. there's a lot to talk about in there. Yeah, yeah. Um, one, one thing, thing that... Sorry, oh, go, just I'll one, one thing it, before go. we touch on this, uh, mm -hmm. also regarding the uh, breaking up of the Soviet Union at the end of the country, uh, the country. I, I'm not sure if he touches on this. Uh, I don't think he does. But this is just another thing to, talk, to keep in mind. Um, during the 1980s and 1990s, um, basically, the Soviet Union had actually withered away a lot of the democratic processes that it actually had before Khrushchev. Khrushchev actually implemented widespread censorship campaigns against um, people like upholding uh, Stalin. Stalin actually had plans to further democratize uh, the country mm -hmm. and actually make it more representative and more transparent and democratic before his death. And he was actually interested in um, removing uh, a lot of the uh, more unscrupulous party members um, from from the upper uh, echelons of the Soviet leadership. Um, but he uh, died before any of that could actually happen. 
and um, Khrushchev actually uh, dismantled a lot of the um, so uh, the more transparent representative uh, aspects and actually crushed down on these things. And um, the Soviet Union definitely was not as uh, represent uh, fully representative as it was before that. Um, but it still was, in my opinion, still a dictatorship of the proletariat, and it still followed Soviet council-style democracy. But um, a lot of people will say, and I think I would agree with this, that um, people like Gorbachev um, was far too uh, powerful in his ability to basically force liberalization on the country uh, from the top down rather than from the bottom up the soviet people right. actually had very little um influence on gorbachev's decisions to uh basically liberalize the country against their will um he started off very popular because people did know that uh you know there was reform was necessary uh the different areas of the soviet union wanted more representation more regional representation they wanted uh, more transparency in their government and stuff like that so they elected uh, Gorbachev through, you know, a normal democratic means uh, into power. But very quickly after he had actually gotten into power, his approval, his his uh, rate of approval actually dropped tremendously because people in the Soviet Union actually were not fans whatsoever of the uh, market, chaotic market forces that he actually unleashed into the country um, against people's will and all from the top down. He didn't experiment. He didn't do any kind of small-scale market testing, like seeing what worked, what didn't. Um, yeah. He just kind of implemented it all at once. And he opened the gateway for basically um, capitalist influence in the country that hadn't been there before to basically spread completely unhindered and not checked by uh, any interest in the public good whatsoever, which eventually would lead to the undemocratic dissolution of the Soviet Union. But, uh, there was actually a referendum in 1991 held um, shortly before the Soviet Union uh, was dissolved. And actually, I believe it was something like 80 something percent of uh, Soviet citizens actually wanted to keep the Soviet Union together, albeit in a different form. Um, but this was completely discarded. And the Soviet um, Supreme, the Supreme Soviet of the Soviet Union was actually barricaded by a uh, reactionary forces led by Yeltsin and they had their power shut off they were surrounded by tanks firing into the building until they eventually were forced to give in so this was a completely illegal by any stretch of the imagined take uh takeover yeah. of power by foreign capitalist influence that was backed 100 percent by the democratic party of the united states if you think the democratic party is uh you know uh, damage control that they would be more friendly no, when they actually when they have a chance, they spot blood in the water, they pounce. No matter what party is in power, Bill Clinton gave millions and millions of dollars into funding Yeltsin's campaign, despite his uh, even after the Soviet Union was dissolved, um, Russians were miserable, they were poor, they were impoverished um, by the dissolution of the Soviet Union, and Yeltsin's approval rating was in single digits. But yet he managed to win consistently in elections due to american electoral interference into their de democratic supposedly democratic system after the soviet union fell apart so if anything we kind of see how foreign capitalist intervention into these actually quite representative bottom-up societies distorts and destroys democratic influence against uh the popular will basically that's basically if i had to summarize uh, how kind of this democratic process actually was degraded. Um, that's kind of how I would do it. And I think right. we can learn a lot and improve a lot from this, but we have to keep in mind that this was largely a result of forces that were not a result of the system. Like most Soviet citizens actually regarded their system as more democratic and more fair than those in the West. Um, but that was, you know, not meant to be <laughs> according to the United States. Anyways, I think we can keep going. Um, I think so, you were saying yeah, the something. next question is about uh, Ding Xiaoping and his takeover of the Chinese Communist Party. Mm -hmm. um, do yeah. you want to touch on this, <coughs> FVK? 
Um, yeah, I'll say what I know about this. Um, from my interpretation, from what I've read so far, it very much seems like, once again, this is an example of there being two different tendencies in the dictatorship of the proletariat. Um, now, I know that there was like the Deng Xiaoping group, and there was also like what I think would be fair to call like the ultra leftist side, um, the Gang of Four and people like that. And, you know, Deng Xiaoping, um, you know, of course, he came out on his on top and his faction. Um, in my own opinion, we were talking about this a little bit before, but Deng Xiaoping to me represents um, kind of like what you would call like the Bukharin aspect of like, I don't know, the working class movement, meaning that, you know, he saw the what, you know, we call the NEP, the new economic policy. Um, he wanted to institute that something like that in China for a long time and make it an expanded program. And, you know, in that regard, I mean, you know, that, that's kind of a different topic, but it was essentially a moment where these two different tendencies were fighting against each other in China. And, you know, I mean, I would, in my personal opinion, I'd rather have like, you know, the Maoist line um, continued, but in that situation, you know, the ultra leftists would have probably drove China into the ground. And it was, I mean, there have been major successes under, you know, the Deng Xiaoping style socialism with child, um, Chinese characteristics and everything. So in that regard, I mean, I think it's fair that um, to give Deng Xiaoping some credit in that regard. But um, I mean, as far as he's, he asks here, if it's a capitalist state and everything, and I know that's a big question to everybody right now. Um, so I'm, I'm curious how um, either Danky or, or you there would like to uh, address that question. Yeah, I mean, with regards to a party, uh, I think Angelo, the, the general secretary of the Party of Communists, put this brilliantly that all communist parties walk a tightrope uh, with ultra leftism on one side and right wing opportunism on the other. So it becomes very difficult to navigate, especially in light of the entire Cold War dynamic. And I think nuclear annihilation changes the game. It changes the circumstances entirely. And I think China largely had to reject that ultra leftist tendency in order to save themselves from being obliterated. Because, I yes. mean, as we have seen uh, in history... The United States has no qualms uh, bom uh, bombing Asian people with nukes. Mm -hmm. And I mean, so addressing a lot of people who criticize places like China or the Soviet Union for um, not exporting revolution, not going through, you know, Trotsky's kind of idea of permanent revolution, things like that, you have to realize that no matter what area, let's say you have a revolution in some country or something like that, no matter where you are, like war is never something that your population is just going to do for you for just purely just ideological reasons war means a ton of suffering and a ton of misery for the people no matter what kind of war it is and if you are looking down the barrel of nuclear annihilation especially uh that like danky said that definitely changes the game a lot but Going off of kind of uh, the Deng Xiaoping thing, um, you cannot understand why things happened in China the way that they did um, if you don't really understand the conditions that China was under at the time. Because, like, people kind of have a very uh, great man of history view of uh, these things. They just assume it's like, oh, it's just their personal... You know, these politicians come in and they have their own personalities that lead them to either be awesome, great leaders uh, who just do everything right, or they're just in evil, history, treacherous, you know, yeah. mustache twirling villains who just want to betray all of these good uh, workers and everything like that. But that's really a very, very idealistic and very oversimplified way of looking at history in the first place, because as materialists as historical materialists we know the societies evolve to adapt to the conditions that they're under um and that's very much true in the case of china because if you look at what condition china was in before mao's death and after mao's death mao had done a lot of 
uh, great things, you know, industrializing the country, educating the country, providing, um, you know, basic health care to people in the country. But he, I think we can fairly criticize him for pretty much being an ultra leftist in very many areas of his life. Huge impact on um, how Chinese people and people around the world uh, were evaluating what he had done at the time of his death. Not every single Chinese person in the country was just loving Mao and super super on board with Mao's policies uh, by the time he had died. Because let's be face let's face it, the Great Leap Forward that he had orchestrated basically in a very top down way uh, was pretty in many regards a failure that actually right. had done um, a lot of damage to the economy. Um, I would like to add, just add one quick thing there. Um, I'll have to find a source on this. Um, I think I think you're right. There is fair criticism to, um, as far as Mao goes during that Great Leap Forward period. But um, it is interesting to note that actually Deng Xiaoping was over a lot of the Great Leap Forward. Um, so, I mean, like, it, oh, yeah. it's so okay. hard to, like, you know, say where blame is, but yeah. People. Like, Mao right. obviously was not trying to, you know, cause economic damage and do, you know, bad things. I'm sure he had, I mean, he obviously had good intentions, and I think a lot of the people uh, in the in the Communist Party were had the right intentions as well, but he didn't really approach it in a very scientific way. He didn't approach things in, like, for example, uh... With the, with the steel thing, he basically just decided to go all in on one strategy. We want all the farmers to all make steel in their backyards. He didn't do any like small-scale testing. He didn't uh, approach it with really a scientific perspective of like testing. Like You have a hypothesis, you test it, you go through all this. He just kind of went all in on yeah. this. And I think this is something we can really criticize him for because... Uh, if you just implement a, a problem on a huge scale and there's any sort of flaws in that problem, those flaws are going to be magnified tremendously. And that's uh, something I think we can criticize him for, even though he, he did have, like, I think the fact that people uh, were so enthusiastically going through and following uh, his directives, you know, that obviously shows that he had a huge amount of love and respect among the people um, who were, you know, going through all of this. They trusted him to do that, um, but, you know, it didn't work out. Um, but also the Cultural Revolution, you know, you, the Cultural Revolution is an extremely complicated topic, but by the end of the Cultural Revolution, there had been essentially large groups of Red Guards who were fighting each other um, in extremely factionalist ways. Uh, the country had been basically in chaos. People had been had their lives completely disrupted through this whole ordeal. Um, and the country was politically isolated from basically everybody. It was isolated from the Soviet Union. It was isolated from the West. It was isolated from other socialist countries, especially Vietnam. After the Vietnam, uh, the Vietnamese had won their war against the U.S. The Chinese uh, under Mao actually had a, a pretty failed border conflict with Vietnam. So China was kind of a pariah state at the time of Mao's death. And a lot of people were very disillusioned with um, communism and the Communist Party in general. Yeah. Um, people really were very skeptical about a lot of a lot of the things that uh, they had been promised would have been achieved, and they were pretty skeptical of these hardline ultra left, uh, basically adventurist uh, members of the Communist Party and the Gang of Four and things like that. They kind of wanted, you know, to try something different. And, you know, you can say Deng Xiaoping was an opportunist, like maybe he was, but the fact that he rose to power and actually uh, on a, a large wave of popular support through China's democratic process, and it does have a democratic process, mm -hmm. uh, does show that people were wanting to try something different, right? And we can't ignore that. Um, the, for Like, for example... Uh, while Mao was alive, uh, Zhao and Lai, who was an extremely popular and intelligent and skilled diplomat under Mao, um, was extremely popular and had brokered a lot of uh, important um, agreements and deals. And he actually 
was pretty instrumental in mitigating a lot of the extremely harmful effects of the uh, Cultural Revolution, and it was actually very widely admired by <laughs> the Chinese people as somebody who could kind of rein in a lot of Mao's uh, ultra-left excesses, right? Yeah. But he, he died, and Mao was very much jealous on a personal scale, because he was actually very... He was generally pretty petty when it came to, um, you know, people being more popular than he was or kind of being rivals to him. Um, Mao actually kind of uh, forbid people from mourning Zhao Enlai's death, which didn't do him any favors in terms of popularity. Wow. Um, so, I mean, Deng Xiaoping was able to kind of position himself as a uh, more moderate Marxist-Leninist alternative who would kind of keep things back to normal, keep things orderly. And that's really what I think a lot of Chinese people at the time, apart from the far left and far right, were kind of looking for um, at the time. So, I mean, yeah. Do you guys have any things to say about that, kind of going going off of that? Yeah. I think, I think we should actually... One more thing, sorry. I think everybody who's listening to this video should go on Wikipedia and look up elections in China. Because I think you're going to, I think I can probably read people's minds right now. They're going to say, oh, well, I mean, all of this would be not a problem if China didn't have, uh, if China had an actual democratic system. If you look, go on Wikipedia and look up how China's electoral system works. It's actually remarkably similar to the Soviet democratic system that I outlined in this thing. It works on basically the same principles. Um, where you have local meetings, they hold elections, they elect candidates who go up into uh, you know regional areas. And China is a massive country. And different areas of China, different provinces of China, are basically like countries in and of themselves in terms of population and size and everything. So um, there is actually a huge amount of direct representation in these areas and ways for the public to actually express themselves. So I think you yeah. should definitely look into that. Sure. I, I think it's Do your own I think research. it's interesting to uh, to note too, like as far as like democracy in China goes now. Um, I mean, if you wanted to be the general secretary of the Communist Party in China, you really couldn't just like go around saying, "Oh, I want to be the general secretary." You really have to like prove it by merit, and yes. that's really how like Xi Jinping got in. I mean, he he was like working for years in these different like you know districts and stuff like that. So, like, I, I think that's an interesting point about it, too, is, like, you, you can't, it's not, like, here in the West where we kind of, it is very much a popularity contest. Um, that very much affects how our politicians present themselves. Um, I mean, I mean, there's an obviously stark contrast between the way our, our politicians and, like, somebody like Xi Jinping. Um, you know, I think a lot of people in the West, like, when they see it, they're, they're kind of, like, confused because it's, like, they're very classy they're very like i don't know they don't argue a lot in, uh, um it's a different China, thing yeah people in the west tend to see their system as the one true universal system that just needs to be applied everywhere it it's like oh it's just this amazing system that just everybody should be doing everybody should have a western u.s style system where there's two parties who are pretty much identical more or less and that's the that's the way to have a happy population. But if you look at uh, U.S. approval ratings for their government, um, I think the highest it's ever been in the past 20 years uh, is something like 60 percent. That's like the that's like incredible rates of approval, right? Like any like pretty much a president when they're elected. Or if there's like a war or something, like Bush's approval rating shot up after 9/11 or something, but pretty much immediately, they are pretty much always the approvals for Congress, the approvals for um, the president in these Western countries, is usually hovering at like 30, 40 percent when they're doing fine, or even less when they really mess up. Like, what kind of demo democratic system is it that? at best only really makes like half of the people in the country just moderately satisfied you know what i mean yeah whereas exactly. if you look at china right now like take a guess as to what 
uh, the Chinese people's approval rating is of their government. This is conducted by independent Western surveys. It's not like some like Chinese government, uh, you know, orchestrated thing where they'll kill you if you say no or something like that. Like, what would you guess it, w- it would be? Oh, approval rating. Um, yeah, I, I like, would like, say uh, um... approval of like how ha- like Chinese people's opinions on the direction of their country, whether they are like in favor of it or not in favor of it broadly. If I had to guess, I would say I would say like maybe seventy percent. It's it's uh, I believe it is like eighty seven percent. Really? Okay. Uh, conducted by wow. I believe it was Gallup or uh, Pew Research. Uh, yeah. So the Chinese yeah. people are actually people are like, oh, I, I support uh, the Chinese people and not the Chinese government. Well, the Chinese <laughs> people love their government because it actually yeah. responds to their needs. I want to throw out a addresses there. Yeah, I want, I want to throw out a quick um, fact there. I, I just learned this the other day. I was kind of blown away. There's more people in the Chinese Communist Party than there is people living in Germany. So it's yes. like it's a, it's a massive members, apparatus, right? 90 million members, right? It's not just some elite group of uh, aristocrats who just profit off of the misery and suffering of of their people, right? Like you can say, oh, China has wealth inequality. And things like that but this is that's that's something that they've taken into account like if you have coastal cities Deng Xiaoping talks about this uh, if you have coastal cities that are uh, in special economic zones where uh, foreign uh, foreign investors can kind of set up shop in places like that uh, you're going to have an increase in wealth in one area and maybe in another area in like a rural interior area of china that economic development is not going to be as quick but this is something and this is something that would never happen in a capitalist system um the chinese government is utilizing those resources those productive forces to further develop areas that are not even of uh they're not profitable for them they have actually i think believe this year they'll be wiping out poverty in china completely i believe the the poverty rate in the united states is about 14.5 percent uh china has basically eliminated poverty they provided education housing health care um and i believe more or less uh employment to pretty much everybody although i don't think they have 100 percent employment they're pretty dang Mm -hmm. close um and so this is what happens when you have a country that is capable of utilizing market forces, utilizing foreign technology and foreign industry when it benefits their people, but they're actually capable of, like we see with the, we see with coronavirus and things like that, they're actually capable of reining in a lot of the um, negative effects of free market systems uh, pretty effectively, and they're able to utilize their resources to um improve the lives of their citizens in a way that's not uh you know it's not profitable for them but they do it because their country is run by the workers themselves more or less right um which you know that sort of leads that sort of leads into the next question where uh they say did the chinese proletariat vote for xi to become the leader of the country for life yeah, so that's a really good country, uh, question. We had kind of addressed this earlier before we started recording, actually. Never mind. Um, but the fact that there are no term limits to in a country does not mean that they're an emperor for life or anything like that. Um, you know what other countries uh, have no term limits? Germany, uh, the Netherlands, um, I believe a lot of the Swedish Nordic countries uh have no term limits on their uh heads of state um uh uh, oh the united states before world war ii before fdr had no term limits um if you don't have term limits that just means you have to keep getting elected yeah into your position it does not mean that you're guaranteed to serve for life right you still have to be doing enough for your people to get elected yeah you still have to try yeah, you're not going. You're not going to say. Uh, I mean, obviously, Germany is a dictatorship of the bourgeois, et cetera, et cetera. But um, you're not going to say Angela Merkel or whatever is 
a brutal empress of <laughs> of Germany, right? Because she doesn't have term limits. She just gets reelected, you know. However, the electoral uh, process is determined there. That's how it works. Um, the Chinese, I believe, have said that somebody like Donald Trump uh, would never be able to get into power in China because their system emphasizes uh, meritocracy more than pretty much anything else. In order to even get near positions of power, you have to yeah. first prove yourself at the local level. You have to be like a local administrator. You have to do a good job. You have to go through rigorous testing. Um, you have to go through lots of study. Um, and then only after you've proved yourself to be a good regional administrator, uh, as elected by your peers through direct democracy, uh, you might be able to work your way up to um, managing maybe a province. That's what Xi Jinping actually did. He worked himself uh, basically to become the leader of a province in China. I forget what the name of it was, but um, yeah, he did he he did extremely well in poverty mitigation efforts and fighting corruption in his own area. And then he was able to kind of work his way up from there through um, this basically Soviet style, not exactly Soviet style, but, you know, uh, basically the democratic uh, internal mechanisms of the party and was able to uh, be elected to be the president, which is a ceremonial position of the uh, head, uh, the the leading council, the lead, leading uh, commission, committee of the Chinese Communist Party. So like, it takes a lot of work and a lot of determination and effort in order to work your way up, right? There's no way that you can just kind of enter and just immediately coast on your celebrity status like you can in the united states right and um yeah. of the like 10 people who are like heading the central commission of the chinese communist party because they don't rule by one person they rule in uh collectively through the politburo and through the you know they rule as, as a collective but out of the like 10 people who are like in the central staff of the chinese communist party uh nine out of ten of them are from working class backgrounds so they they come from like farming families. They come from yeah, uh, you know, industrial workers and things like that. I believe Xi Jinping is the only one who has relatives in, who were previously party members. So like, make of that what you will. But like, you know, if ninety percent of American representatives were working class, came from impoverished or working class backgrounds, we would freaking. Be, it would be a massive improvement <laughs> I wouldn't even ima i can't even imagine um <laughs> and then uh, yeah that sort of leads into the next sort of question they say um you know they're quoting me they say you ask would it make sense to allow capitalists into the vanguard party then they go on to say and you look at the chinese communist party over a hundred billionaires inside the party this is what we're talking about most marxist leninists slash Maoist are living in some form of bubble where they can't answer these questions and instead call us rad libs and our kitties and so on <laughs> I think half of this uh, half of this comment is just sort of you know them so the Chinese Communist angry. Party has 90 million members and I actually just did the math on that on my phone um, 100 people out of 90 million is wait where's my phone it's 0 0.000 uh hang on 0.000001% <laughs> of the Chinese Communist Party is billionaires. And do you know like why I mean okay. So I think we need to just quickly go over why China had to incorporate foreign investment in the first place because like you can't just under like you can't just look at it in a vacuum right like we talked about you have to be materialist and understand kind of the machinations of why things are the way that they are rather yeah. than just looking at personality so think about the position that china is in it has a huge pop after mao's death it has a huge population it has um an actually very well educated population that's very skilled and very hard working um but they don't have Basically, I mean, they have some industrial improvements that were under Mao, but they don't have any access to foreign technology. They're completely isolated and cut off from the world. 
more or less. Um, they don't have blueprints. They don't have uh, really any foreign technologies that they need in order to industrialize their economy and create um, a massive surplus of um, produ production and produced goods. Um, and so they basically cut a bargain and take a big gamble with the West where they say, okay, we will be your center for manufacturing. We will produce cheap goods for you. But they don't just do this for no reason because they're evil, you know, capitalist pigs who just want to get rich or whatever yeah. for their own benefit. <clears throat> Sorry. They, there are lots of terms and conditions that go along with this that I think ultimately benefit China quite a lot in the long run because what they do is they say okay if you're in a foreign firm you're an american firm who wants to set up shop in the united in in china what you have to do is you have to create a a um you have to merge your company in our in our country with our own chinese firm and you have to share all of the um blueprints and all of the technology that you bring to our country we get access to that so that we can make it ourselves um also, uh, you're restricted to these zones that we put heavy restrictions and control over. Uh, we have party uh, people to basically uh, make sure that uh, the interests of the workers are con are being respected. And we have, sorry, uh, oh yeah, um, every single Chinese worker is entitled to join a union and strike. And the Chinese government pretty much unanim unanimously uh, backs striking workers over foreign capitalists. Um, but also, Chinese uh, people who are owning a business are actually extremely severely dealt with when they actually do break the rules of the Chinese Communist Party. Like, they're, China executes billionaires in their country when they break the law. Can you imagine in the United States a billionaire being executed for literally anything that they did? Yeah, like ever? It'd, it'd be like during the French Revolution when they uh, <laughs> beheaded the king. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. the, exactly. So their idea is we can develop our economy and get... Because Marx, even Marx himself, the man, the, man, the myth, the legend, he, he did agree that capitalism does bring benefits. Capitalism is a substantial um, advancement in technology and in uh, various ways, right? Like he, he was very much uh, always talking about how it was actually a, a relatively progressive force for the time yeah. um, compared to feudalism. And Lenin actually talks about this as well. He talks about how state capitalism, which I think is what currently the relations of China are, state capitalism is actually a substantial step forward above normal capitalism because essentially... You, it's run by a workers' party controlled democratically through the dictatorship of the proletariat. Um, you have this, these sort of market forces at play, but they're very closely managed and they're used for the for the furthering of development in your country. And if those capitalist forces go against the will of the people, then they can just shut that off, right? The 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 capitalist forces yeah. are not in command of the country, which is the the biggest thing about this. And if you go on, like, Chinese, you know, government websites and stuff like that, they actually do incorporate a lot of planning into their economy. Um, they actually have five-year plans, and they actually more or less hold to those five-year plans. So you could say, oh, well, they're just deceiving everybody into thinking that they're moving towards socialism. Uh, but really, they're not. Well, if they really are sneaking away from socialism and going towards capitalism, then they're d contradicting that intention by their actions because they're actually following what they're saying that they're going to be doing. And they're not really giving me any indication that they're trying to deceive anybody. So, like, Hakim talks about this, but he's he basically says China is currently state capitalist in its mode of production, but politically it is socialist. It is a, a dictatorship of the proletariat that is moving towards socialism. So we'll have to see, like, my position is on China that we can't know what's like in the hearts of every single Chinese Communist Party member, right? But the best yeah. that we can do is basically um, support them, uh, defend them against obvious lies, and hope that they 
uh, move in a more Marxist direction. And I think under Xi Jinping, that's kind of what they're doing because he specifically talks about how uh, Deng Xiaoping's ideas were correct for their time, but nowadays they need to start moving in a more uh, socialist direction, moving towards, um, you know, moving away from reliance on foreign industry. Right. Because they're, they're, but it's but again, it's a gradual thing. They're not going to just careen into adventurism uh, as things are getting better, like Mao might have done. Uh, just because you know mm-hmm. it's more revolutionary like they have to work with the people and if the people are in favor of what's happening right now then they're going to just continue their course basically and we just have to wait and see what they do but mm-hmm. i think that it's i don't know i think that they're moving in in the right direction more or less right. towards a socialist uh option they also um the commenter also brings up vietnam they say it's another corrupted vanguard party that they're enriching themselves while uh, most people are poor. And he says, sure, there are middle class living in big cities, but you travel out and there you see all the poor, both in China and in Vietnam. And I think this is kind of hearkening back to what I'm saying or what what we were talking about earlier, that uh, these countries didn't start off from an ideal perspective and they're uh they are constantly suffering from various constraints be it imperialism or uh you know geographic constraints and so Mm -hmm. you know these countries are going to have to implement various policies to modernize and even in the soviet union uh you saw a policy like the nep being implemented and i i don't think it's outside the norm for a communist party to adopt measures like that in order to uh, increase foreign investment and that right. kind of thing, in order to right. increase the productive capacity of a country. Yeah, if you are a like American or Western leftist living in a comfortable, you know, situation in your home country, you've never been invaded, you've never been bombed, you've never had to fight, you know, any invading force or anything like that. It's very easy for you to criticize Vietnam or places like that. Exactly. But you have to think, this is a country that literally for like 30 years fought against the Japanese, they fought against the French, and they fought against the Americans for decades, right? Fighting against them to basically free their country and liberate their people from colonial oppression, right? And they managed to do that, despite the fact that they're, like millions of their people were just basically genocided by napalm and constant bombing and just brutal intervention that split their country apart. Um, and so these guys are like, you know, they know what the shit is. Like, they've been through all of that stuff. There are people today in Vietnam who were, you know, doing all of this stuff, right? And if you actually... Like, you, wait, wait, I, I, thank you. You should list this in the uh, the description of your video. But you should look up yeah. a channel called Luna Oi. Oh, I, I love Luna her. Oi. Yes, her and American Johnson, who is an anarchist, both are extremely supportive of Vietnam and are willing to call it socialist. Right? Like, I'm not an expert in Vietnamese politics, but like, the Vietnamese people are in supportive are supportive of the system that they have going on there and i mean you can go into her channel she literally shows a footage from the floor of the vietnamese like central committee she shows like the debates that they have um you know the the different ways that vietnam's socialist system works how they protect interest of workers and how they provide like free rice they provide um health care they provide like guaranteed housing for different people and they are like constantly improving their standard of living under a politically at least socialist system and i think also economically they have a lot of control over their system kind of like china so it's very easy for you mm-hmm. know a white anarchist <laughs> to I criticize mean... these people but like if think about it from this perspective if you were leading a country let's say you had the most pure intentions possible you're not evil whatsoever it's got to be really freaking difficult to basically make your country a pariah state 
from cut off from the entire rest of the world, sabotaged by sanctions from the U.S. Um, like, I mean, obviously that's what the DPRK, that's the path that they chose. And I mean, I'm not criticizing them for doing that. I Even mean, I Venezuela think to a certain extent. Keep, yeah. I mean, they managed to kind of keep themselves kind of cut off from the rest of the world. And, you know, we can talk about how well or not they uh, are managing to keep going, kind of resisting all of this stuff. But there's a huge amount of pressure that isn't willing to cooperate, at least somewhat, with the international market. Because that's really what the United States cares about. And any country that refuses to do that, the U.S. will stop at absolutely nothing to crush their economy, sabotage them, sanction them, overthrow their country, and sow instability. Uh, right? So, yeah. like... Yeah. yeah. I mean, what's the alternative? What can you say? I mean, do these, do these Western anarchists really have a better uh, geopolitical analysis than the Communist Party of Vietnam or the Communist Party of China? I mean, do they not think yeah. that... You know how many how many million people were in the CPC? Ninety million. Yeah, I mean, do they not think that these ninety million people might know uh, a little bit more about the situation than right. somebody and who do, doesn't and, really even read? Or theory? do they even think that they, they they might think that these people are all just like drones or something? But they, I'm sure within ninety million people, you're going to have a huge diversity in thought. People you know, approving of certain policies that they implement, other, d disagreeing with other policies, debating these policies. Like, there's a huge amount of... I'm sure there's a lot of people who are extremely far left, far right, in all these parties, just like there is in any other country, right? And to diminish them and say, oh, these are just drones, or these are just unthinking, you know, party bureaucrats, 90 million party bureaucrats, which is like one-third the population of the United States. Yeah. Uh, it's just ridiculous and condescending to the extreme yeah because i mean the next remark was you know it, it they say this is why we call you guys delusional and uh, apparently we don't see reality and instead we're trying to create some form of a false bubble where we can believe that the vanguard party that lenin talked about is what we're looking at today but i think it's the exact opposite i think yeah leftists who are not even willing to even learn that's the biggest thing you can if you put in the effort and you learn about these countries and you take the time to actually think about and read about how their system is set up and the way that and the, all the history that they've gone through to get to the point that they are and you can still criticize them for different things i mean i criticize these countries all the time that's totally fine and i understand that right but if you just don't if you just shut your brain off and you don't even want to think about it you just blindly accept the fox news equivalent of a narrative that right. is basically shoveled down our throat from the moment that we're born and you think that you're the free thinker and that we're the ones who are basically in a bubble not willing to learn anything then i don't know what to say man i think yeah you should just i, I kind of want to add to that you know it, 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 like what he was saying he's he was saying um there's a couple of things that he said that exposed his understanding of like Marxism, I think, like he says in Vietnam, oh, there's poor people outside of the cities and there's like rich people and, um, you know, there's not much of a middle class and all this stuff. I mean, that is kind of basic Marxism. I think it's the Gotha program where he talks about, you know, the society after capitalism is going to have like the birth pangs of the old society to a degree. And, you know, he talked a little bit about, you know, there will still be classes to a degree. So, you know, that, that's kind of like a um, maybe like a little bit of an obvious one to me. But obviously under socialism, you know, we're still going to have classes. We're still going to have class distinctions and competing ideas as far as these um, different classes go. But, um, you know, uh, like you're pointing out, I mean, at least make a, an attempt to understand like the basics of Marxism and like, you know, the history of some of these countries before you just write them off and say, Oh, forget about all these people. It, it's kind of funny because, like, a lot of these people. I mean, I'm not accusing them of like being racist or anything, but no. I mean, a lot of anarchists. You know, they're they're like anti-racist, but it's like, I don't know. That kind of implies to me we got to go out of our way to learn more about other cultures and it's... why they do certain things. And it's like they they are anti-racist, but they don't like go as far to like extend. You know, how do I learn about these other societies and why they do certain things? They just reject them like, 
I don't know, almost like a right winger would and be like, oh, they're weird and kind of different. The, otherwise, right. I just like don't want them. It's, it's, sort of reminds it's not me... racism. It's just chauvinism, essentially. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Lenin talks about this all the time. It sort of reminds me of an old quote from the Lord. Uh, he says, uh, before you pull the speck of dust out of your neighbor's eye, you need to remove the plank out of your own eye. <laughs> and, you know, it's it's a well, old timey way of saying you need to check yourself before you wreck yourself and stop judging these other countries, which are, you know, at least on the right track while you're living in the Imperial core. You're living like in the depths of Mordor, like at the, <laughs> right at the base of Mount Doom. And you're going to criticize the Shire about, you know, how they run things. Come right. on. Well, actually, it's funny that you said the Lord said that quote because Lenin actually has a quote <laughs> something that says um he's like before you criticize the Polish uh communists and the German communists and everything you need to you need to look at home first you need to turn towards your own country and criticize your own Kautskis your own opportunists your own revisionists you need to criticize your own like czarist regimes that's that's what you need to be targeting the brunt of your attention and anger and resources towards not exactly looking at other countries and you know basically just shitting on them all the time no you know, Chomsky. Like, like what are what are white anarchists doing to overthrow capitalism that is more impressive than these countries that are resisting uh imperial invasion and providing mutual aid and uh, mutual assistance to other countries, uh, right? Like the Soviet Union, yeah. for all of its faults, it was the reason why Cuba was able to liberate itself from the Batista dictatorship. Uh, the reason it provided funding and mutual aid and education and food and support to Vietnam when it was fighting against the French and the Americans. It provided aid everywhere to all of these different revolutionary groups, right? Yeah. Is that not as impress? Is that not more impressive than, you know, an anarchist basically sitting in their armchair at home and just whining? And like, what are you doing? Yeah. What are you doing and, for your revolution? And uh, you know, even in contemporary times, in the coronavirus case, like Vietnam and Cuba are sending doctors all over the globe to help. Vietnam's yes, even sending absolutely. doctors over here. You know, the country that dropped Agent Orange on them and, and bombed them back to the Stone mm -hmm. Age. It's, it's, you know, it's absolutely. incredible how the evil States and authoritarian Europe. these uh, authoritarian red fascist governments are. Exactly. It, I mean, so China horrible. provided, for all the people in quarantine, they provided food. They, they utilized their police force not to uh, shoot and oppress uh, you know, minority groups who are trying to get food and stuff for their families, like they do in the U.S., the police in, in China actually, and Vietnam, uh, and Cuba, um, are basically tasked during this quarantine of delivering food to elderly people, uh, disabled people, um, basically just making sure that all these people are provided for. Um, that's not something that you see in a capitalist country where the police basically just exist to protect profit right at all yeah um so, and i mean the united states had all the advantages in the world uh all the time to prepare they had all they obviously have all the resources they're you know sitting on just mountains of money uh but yet <laughs> yeah. they they are literally just absolutely just driving off a cliff in terms of uh the coronavirus uh vietnam is right on the border of china right it had the least amount of time to prepare yeah um right next to basically the heart of everything and they had zero coronavirus deaths zero deaths right like they've had like uh maybe like 100 200 infections or something like that right wow like there's a substantial like you can like even if you think oh it's state capitalist oh blah 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 that is clear evidence of the superiority of an economy that is you know, even though it might have market forces, all of its productive forces are subservient to the public good, right? That is yeah. what yeah. is all about in the end, right? And we can clearly see that, right? The United States is incapable, even though it has all the advantages of the world, one little fly 
goes in into the ointment in the United States, and the whole system just fucking collapses exactly. immediately. And so yeah. they go on to say that the dictatorship of the oligarchy is a better word for what happens when you build a vanguard party, which is in the hands of the few and not the proletariat. Now, I think when we talked about uh, how Soviet democracy worked, I think we pretty much cleared that up. So I don't really think we should address that. Uh, so moving on, they said, like I said, uh, did the Soviets vote for USSR to fall? If not, then how could the reactionaries take over? I also think we pretty much addressed this too. Yeah, we, we talked about the Khrushchev, well. uh, Khrushchev uh, you know, thing. We talked about the illegal uh, dissolution of the USSR. So um, they say the answer to these questions are very easy. This is what happens when a few people at the top control the masses. Again, I think that was pretty much addressed in our discussion of Soviet yeah. uh, democracy. Um, yeah, I would like to add one quick thing to that. Um, that is kind of the heart of the anarchist critique. Yeah. And it does, I mean, like, I, I think it is very important for us to go through this stuff and really try and spell it out like we're doing. But at the end of the day, I mean, it, a lot of these people, they, they don't care. It, the world isn't that nuanced to them. They see very black and white. And, you know, they see power as like, you know, just this corrupting force that, um, you know, will just like make you work in your own interest. And it's not capitalism as much as it is just like this um, weird view of what power means. And it's a very vague yeah. definition of power. So it's like, yeah, there's a, there's a lot more to talk about there. But like that seems for, for me, it seems to be their biggest hurdle as far as like how they can't give any type of support to these countries because they're like, well, that would go against my interest because they're obviously corrupt, powerful politicians or something like that. Even if you think that, even if you think that um, under socialism, like the party just becomes uh, just as evil and corrupt and d destructive as under a capitalist regime, even if you think that, socialist countries, I, I'll, I'll, I'll send you a link to this, thank you, so you can put it in the description. Socialist sure. countries provide a higher quality of life According to the World Bank and according to uh, uh, UNESCO, uh, what, what was it? Is like the internet, the UN's uh, measurements. Socialist qualities, uh, socialist countries provide a higher quality and standard of living in literally every single like category in terms of like life expectancy, in terms of like child nutrition, uh, housing, um, education, st uh, quality and educational liter uh, literacy achievements, and things like that than capitalist countries that are at the same level of economic development. So if you compare like a, a neoliberal capitalist country, uh, let, let's compare two countries that are in very similar conditions but have two separate sets of economic conditions. Right. So like if you look at uh, Haiti, for example, which is a country in uh, like kind of the Caribbean area um, that has before you know 1950s or so, had very similar um, standard of living to Cuba, um, at pretty much exact levels of economic development. Uh, Haiti pursued basically a neoliberal U.S.-backed uh, regime that was fully capitalist, and Cuba uh, liberated itself from U.S.-backed regime and managed to use the resources that it had, which were not a lot, but the resources that it did have, it was able to put those towards um, providing... Uh, social services, uh, hospitals, uh, e education, uh, housing for its people, like, it's not even a comparison, right? And this applies to pretty much any, like, Latin American country, too. Like, socialist countries like Cuba are able to provide way more for their people. So even if you think that uh, uh, power just corrupts and you know we can't have a state or anything like that we can't be able to have an army to defend ourselves because then you'll be evil even if you think that that makes them just as evil as the capitalist countries quote unquote <laughs> materially it is just objectively better for people to live in countries that are able to control their own resources and use them for the benefit of their people rather than for international capitalism so that's all I'm going to say yeah I think those are all very good points. Um, to wrap it up, just overall, they seem like they're arguing both against Marxist-Leninist and against Maoists. 
And, you know, I just want to, I can't speak for, you know, you guys, but I just wanted to say, you know, I'm not a Maoist. Uh, I think Maoists are ultra leftists. You know, this is part of what we've been arguing against this whole time. Um, as far as that, I would say, like, I mean, I, just to be clear, I think Maoism, if you're in the third world and you have a peasant country, like Maoism is very, you know, it could be very effective for you. But here in the West, you know, personally, I don't see why you would accept Maoism. I mean, we're not going to lead our revolution in that sort of way. Um, but besides that, you know, the last comment that the, that the dude makes here um, he, he says another interesting thing, MLMs, uh, yeah, they can't agree on China. And he says that, you know, Maoists generally criticize China for being capitalist, while, um, you know, the general American is like, oh, they're socialism. You know, China is uh, socialism. And they're... But, like, that kind of shows maybe the commenter's lack of understanding for the nuance for this, because that is the general understanding between, like, I don't know, like Maoist types and like the average American, they yeah. see it in those clear black and white terms. So like, there is your answer. It's not either or. It's a little more nuanced. They're kind of like a state capitalism. So and and Maoism originated in Peru. Uh, it was like what we were discussing. Like at the time of Mao's death, Mao wasn't exactly a very popular, you know, figure. People were ready for change. Uh, so. You know, it, and Mao it's did just... a lot of great things, but also if you like Mao, that does not mean that you have to call yourself a Maoist. Yeah. Because yeah. Mao was a Marxist-Leninist, and he was very adamant about being called a Marxist-Leninist and not a Maoist. Uh, Maoism itself originates, like you said, from the Shining Path in Peru, and those guys, I mean, I mean, sure they did some good things, but they're also like very ultra, like extremely ultra, and. They literally just, I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, they were unsuccessful in seizing state power for the first part, and they also developed a pretty extreme cult of personality around their chairman, and when their chairman got uh, taken down by the Peruvian authorities, their entire organization just completely fell apart. So, like, be a, you know, be a scientific socialist, is what yeah. I'm saying, and don't just, don't just... Uh, go to the supermarket of ideologies and uh, just pick the one with the leader that you like the most you know right definitely well with that I think we have pretty much wrapped up uh, this comment it turned into a great discussion I felt like we hit a lot of points that a lot of anarchists would ask us about this is sort of like an anarchist uh, FAQ almost because uh, we not only answered all of this commenter's questions, but we delve into detailed explanation that I'm sure answered a lot more people's questions as well. Um, and... Yeah, that's why I really appreciate it. I mean, for all of its flaws, I think this was a very um, interesting question. And I believe that the person who came up with this had ver all the best intentions. Like, I, yeah. I'm not mm -hmm. trying to dunk on them or like say that they're stupid or anything like this is yeah. this is the default position that we're all uh basically brought up with from childhood and we're not taught any other details about any of these countries we're taught to look down on them with a very chauvinistic perspective and basically cons not consider any of the um actual historical details or we, we're, we're taught not to ask questions about these countries at all um so right. to, if the person who wrote this thing is watching this uh i think these were really interesting questions and um i just really hope that you'll kind of look at these things with um maybe a more open mind and just kind of always be willing to do your own research <laughs> no Sorry. i think we're good <clears throat> we're, okay. ra we're yeah, yeah. wrapping awesome. it up here folks Okay, great. But yeah, this was a great talk. Um, hopefully this helped. And yeah, yes. thank you, Dan. Thank you for having me on. You're quite welcome. And of course, uh, if you want to do a part two or a follow up, uh, I'd be more than happy to, to set that up. But yes, thank you, uh, Tactical Spork. And thank you, FVK1917, for joining me. This has been a FAQ about communism everybody so thank you very much for watching peace 
All right. Thank you.